Good to be here today and uh, <coughs> hope you enjoy the Sabbath day and you can enjoy the rest that is yours for free to enjoy. It costs you nothing to enjoy the Sabbath. You might think that uh, I lost a day's wages today. Some people are working today and uh, they're earning money. Well, you'll be cared for and uh, that financial aspect of your life will be quite okay because you've kept the Sabbath. And uh, you might think that there were things you could have done, such as caught up on your sleep today. Well, part of the Sabbath is good for that, but uh, Jesus, as his habit was, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and uh, he read the scripture, or he heard it read, and I guess there was some discussion, somewhat like we have with Sabbath school and so on. He refreshed his spiritual life on the Sabbath, and uh, he had a more relaxing Sabbath afternoon, it seems, because he strolled through the wheat fields on East on one occasion and picked some grain for lunch and talked with his disciples. So maybe there's some time on the Sabbath for, uh, for recreation as far as uh, restoration of your physical side is concerned as well. <coughs> but in this life, <coughs> things don't always leave us comfortable, as was mentioned before. In this life we suffer many of the, uh, the ailments and, uh, and problems, both the, the physical and the psychological problems that have been the lot of mankind ever since Adam and Eve uh, failed in their obligation to God in the Garden of Eden. And uh, as we live our lives from day to day, uh, we sometimes feel elated because things seem to be going right and sometimes we feel despondent because things are going wrong. Sometimes we feel as though there's never been a pain in our body and other days we wonder why the pain in our back or whatever, uh, when it will ever go away. And so uh, we uh, suffer the effects of what sin has done in the world. And uh, for some people, they see nothing at the end of the tunnel. And uh, that's a shame because we as Christians have a hope. And our hope is that whatever should befall us in this life, even if it seems to come to the worst, that we die because of the circumstance or the consequence of something, we have a hope that we will live again. Unfortunately, in the Christian church across the, the broad spectrum of Christianity, there has uh, developed some very strange and... Uh, uh, peculiar ideas about this hope. For some, uh, they have fallen into the old uh, traps that uh, beset the Egyptians and the Babylonians and, uh, and uh, the Romans and even some early Christian groups who came to the conclusions that after death uh, there were various uh, things to expect. And probably the most uh, sensible of them all, should I say sensible, most uh, um, likable of them all, which I don't like, but uh, was the Epicureans. The Epicureans were a group of people who had a philosophy and they were generally found in uh, Corinth, but throughout uh, Greece, what we know as the Greek uh, Empire there, um, and their idea was that when you died there was nothing, absolutely nothing. You decayed away to nothing, and uh, there was nothing afterwards. And so the Epicureans used to say, we do not fear death. It was their catchword. We do not fear death. And so if they were in some circumstance and situation which uh, may seem that imminent death was uh, before them, they would say, we do, not feel, uh, we do not fear death, for after death uh, there is nothing. And so, uh, in a sense, it was not a, way, a bad way of, uh, of believing, in a sense. After death, there is nothing. And so they didn't fear death. And so I suppose for those who are not Epicureans, and uh, it is uh, it's perhaps a little bit more troublesome, because after death, what? If uh, after death there is nothing, well, you have nothing to worry about, but most people cannot accept that after death there is nothing. And so they start to wonder, after death there is what? We as Seventh-day Adventists take the Bible uh, very, in a very real sense 
as being truth on all matters of life. And of course we believe that after death there is resurrection. The only thing, the first thing that comes after death is resurrection. I remember studying with a fellow, his name was John. I studied with John, he had no background at all in, uh, in religion and uh, had no knowledge of the Bible or whatever and we studied a whole lot of things and he was getting along really good and uh, I came to a study about what happens after we die and I started to use the word resurrection. We have to, don't we? We use that word as we uh, uh, study the Bible and uh, it's so, so normal to us to use the word resurrection. But I saw that John was pretty puzzled. He didn't uh, understand what I was talking about. And I said to him, John, you're not understanding what I'm saying, are you? And he says, no, I don't know what you're saying. He says, so what's this word resurrection? And he tried to say it and he couldn't really say it because he never read it or heard it or seen it before. Ah, I said, I see where your problem is. So I explained to him what resurrection actually means. And I don't think I have to explain it to anybody here today but uh, just in case there's someone here who has the same problem that John had, resurrection means to be raised from the dead. That's what it means, to be raised from the dead and given your life back again. And when John understood that, his face just beamed because uh, he said, I've always wondered what happened after you died. And he had no idea. And so it brought him a new understanding of what life was all about. And he started to realize that really life doesn't have to end when you die. That there will be a resurrection. And I went on to tell him there will be a resurrection for those who love the Lord. There will be a resurrection eventually for those who do not love the Lord. There will be a resurrection for both camps. And so after death, the first thing that's going to happen is a resurrection. And uh, you're going to be there. Every one of you is going to be in a resurrection unless you live and are alive when Jesus returns again. And so this brings upon our thinking a kind of a uh, obligation and a responsibility. It sobers us up a little bit, doesn't it? Because you are going to live again. You're going to live again whether you like it or whether you don't. And that is sobering, isn't it? You know, it would be rather nice to think perhaps for a, a bad person and I don't suppose you think you're a bad person today, but if you thought and knew that you're a real bad person, to think, well, if I die and there's nothing after that, at least I've got away with it. But uh, if you are a bad person and you know that you're a bad person, let me assure you today, without a shadow of a doubt, that you will come to life again, whether you like it or whether you don't. Now, that sobers you up, doesn't it? It should do. And it makes everyone think a little soberly about what life is all about. You see, in Jesus' time, there were people who did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees, I'm sorry, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They were the modernists of their time. They were the um, a political group who had uh, control of the temple and the services of the temple in Jesus' time. They were the ones who liked to be up with the play in all the latest theology, so-called, so and uh, they were sort of scientifically minded and they'd worked it out that there was no resurrection. You see, the resurrection has been a contentious subject for many, <coughs> uh, many a generation. And even in Jesus' time, the resurrection was a contentious subject. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 22 and uh, just uh, look at uh, um, a little experience of Jesus with these people. Matthew chapter 22, and we want verse 23, and on a little bit, and I'll just uh, take a little bit out of this. I'm not going to explain it all. The same day uh, came, uh, the Sadducees came to Jesus, and they said, uh, because they say there is no resurrection, and they asked Jesus, saying, Master, Moses said if a man died having no children, his brother should marry his wife. That's what Moses had told them. And they should raise up a family to them. To them. Now, we suggest that there were seven brothers. 
and the first one married the lady and he died and the second, third and up to the seventh one he's the seventh brother married the lady and, and he died and so the Pharisees put this <coughs> hypothetical <coughs> but <coughs> a possibility question to Jesus <coughs> whose wife is this lady going to be after she's had the seven husbands whose wife is she going to be in heaven <clears throat> bit of a difficult one isn't it and I guess that question has run through the mind of many people who have had the experience of a second or third marriage and for some people um, some uh, film star that I, I'm aware of has had 12 marriages and uh, so it does pose a, a bit of a problem <clears throat> but Jesus said that they were ignorant and they didn't know what the scripture said and uh, he says <clears throat> that in death for those who are faithful it seems as though life is as if it always was in God's sight when a faithful person dies it's as if they are still alive now that seems to be a bit of a mystery doesn't it but as far as God's concerned if a faithful person dies he is in God's hands and it's as if he is still alive but what will in reality bring him back into a body and a mind it is the resurrection when he is brought back again to his life again and so Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and we won't go into this in detail I bring this up because Jesus uh, believed in resurrection but he did not believe that we should talk nonsense about the resurrection we should not talk nonsense about things that we don't understand and Jesus is saying that things are going to be different in heaven the resurrection is going to bring about a difference in the way we <laughs> relate to one another and Jesus says you're not knowing the scriptures nor do you know the power of God you see, Jesus is saying the power of God can make resurrection quite possible. And if the, the Sadducees had looked back in the history of their own nation, they would have realized that there were people back in Old Testament times who had actually been given their life back again and had been resurrected. In the resurrection, Jesus says they neither marry nor given in marriage, so I'll solve that one problem for you and put you out of your misery there but are like the angels in heaven. Evidently in heaven there is something that is different from the marriage that we understand today. Exactly what it is, exactly how the angels in heaven are in social relationships, I'm not too sure. But evidently there is something that satisfies everybody without the marriage system and relationship that we have here in this world. We don't know exactly what it is. But if God made it, you can be sure it's going to be good. So I suggest that this was a contentious subject. <coughs> Marriage is for this world and uh, as we know it and uh, we don't need to worry about what it will be after the resurrection. God has that in line for us. And uh, then of course there was the experience of Lazarus and if you go to John chapter 11 Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the book of John, chapter 11, which is the account of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And I'm going a little bit quickly here because uh, we don't have a lot of time today, but you'll know the story pretty well, I think. <clears throat> and uh, from verse 11, we read that these things uh, Jesus said, uh, he said, and after that also, to them he says our friend Lazarus sleeps but I'm going that I might awake him out of sleep you see the disciples wondered why Jesus waited so long to go and do something for Lazarus and uh, but Jesus says well I'm going to raise him out of sleep as far as Jesus was concerned Lazarus was asleep and yet Jesus knew quite well that he was dead because he confirmed that later but in Jesus' eyes, Lazarus was asleep. Now, if someone is asleep, they can be raised out of that sleep, can't they? I know it's difficult sometimes to get people to wake up when they're in a dead, deep sleep. 
I remember a fellow who used to work for me and I used to have to go into his house every morning about half past six when he went to work and wake him up so that he'd get up and go to work. Fortunately, he slept in his work clothes anyhow, so uh, after shaking his feet and shaking him around and so on, there'd be some moaning and groaning and eventually he would wake up and uh, <coughs> he would <coughs> grab a donut, which he always left on his sink bench, grab a donut for his breakfast and uh, hop into the van and go to work in the clothes he had worked in and slept in for the last couple of weeks. And, uh, <coughs> but he could be woken up, <laughs> or wakened up, what's the word? You know, at least we could wake him up. And uh, the resurrection is as if one has been asleep and has been awoken from sleep. And Jesus wanted to teach these folks something about what resurrection was about. He didn't have to tell them about what death is about because they knew enough about death. <coughs> but Jesus uh, said that, <coughs> verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the one who has the power over the resurrection. I'm the one who gives life on the resurrection day. And Jesus showed Martha and Mary, no doubt, that uh, he was the one we must look to in order to have a hope in the resurrection. He that believeth in me, Jesus said, even though he is dead, yet he will live. And whoever lives and believeth in me shall never die. And then he says, do you believe this? You see, Jesus is saying that one who dies believing in him doesn't really die the death of eternity. One who dies believing in Jesus dies the temporary death of all who have ever lived. And that temporary death is one where life has to cease because under the circumstances it cannot continue. And that might happen through age, through illness, through breakdown of the system, or through, through murder, or through accident, or whatever. Circumstances which do not allow life to continue brings death, but that death for those who love the Lord is not the death of eternity. That death is the death from which one is raised to life through the power of Jesus and uh, that power Jesus alone has and the judgment as to who will be resurrected is in Jesus' hands entirely. And so we could talk a lot more about, uh, about John. But uh, someone here said something rather funny, rather unusual in a way. When Jesus was going back to the place where Lazarus lived, his disciples got alarmed. They said, Jesus, last time you went there, the Jews wanted to kill you. Why are you going back? And Jesus says, well, there are things that have to be done, and uh, this is the day that has to be done, and I'm going back there. And uh, Thomas, we know Thomas because we call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas says, well, he says, if you're going back there, let us all go back with you and let us all die there. And uh, we'll all die together with you. You see, Thomas had no hope of the resurrection. Thomas didn't understand that there could be a raising from the dead. Thomas perhaps was influenced by the philosophy of the Sadducees. And Jesus proved that resurrection indeed was possible, for he went to the grave that morning went to the tomb and he called Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came in obedience to the call of God and rose to life again. As I say, um, the resurrection is a contentious issue in the New Testament times, even as it is today. It shouldn't be because in the Old Testament, resurrection is referred to and understood. And Job, even in his tough times, recognized that he would, even though he died, see God. In Job chapter 19, you can read it there. And Job, even after all his tough times, says, even though I die, I know that I, in my body, will see God. Job had a hope of the resurrection. Job, in spite of the fact that his wife seemed to turn against him in his dedication to God, had a hope of the resurrection. 
it was well known. And then, of course, in the book of Daniel, chapter, last chapter, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, Daniel refers to the resurrection there, and he refers to it in, uh, as in, in its uh, two phases. One for the resurrection of the, uh, the faithful, and one for the resurrection of those who have neglected their opportunities to be right with God. Let me read it to you. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, and it says, And Daniel is talking about the victory that God's people have over all the forces of evil that have, had to try, that have tried to destroy the truth. And uh, he's talking about this victory. And the greatest victory that any martyr could have over the forces of evil would be to come back to life again after they had lost their life under the pressures of persecution and martyrdom. The greatest victory they could ever have is to have their life given back to them in spite of the fact that the devil tried to destroy them. And so Daniel is saying, and the book of Daniel is a book of victories. It's not a book of defeats. It's a book of victories, prophecies of victories. And he says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And of course, Jesus brought out the same concept as well as we find in John chapter 5, where Jesus also talked about the two resurrections, those who are raised to life, to eternal life, and those who are raised to face their judgment of eternal damnation or eternal death. And so I go back to my thoughts earlier and my statements earlier that no matter which camp one is in, whether they're in the camp of God or whether they're in the camp of the devil, after death, the next thing they will know is resurrection. And whether they like it or whether they don't, and I repeat it, whether they like it or whether they don't, they are faced with resurrection. Whether they are good or whether they are bad, they are faced with the resurrection. Whether they died as martyrs or whether they died uh, <coughs> as persecutors, they will face resurrection. And so it uh, makes us think about how we're going to live our life and what camp we're going to be in if we're going to enjoy the, the uh, resurrection that is inevitable for us. We could talk a lot about the apostles and those who... Uh, uh, gave so much uh, time to the study of the, the uh, subject of resurrection. But uh, uh, I think it would be sufficient to say this morning that the, two, the, the three greatest exponents of resurrection in the New Testament are Jesus on the one hand, John on the other, and Paul the third. So there's Jesus, and there is John, and there is Paul. They are the great exponents of the resurrection. And uh, they, because of, of their uh, uh, preaching and the audiences that they had to deal with, uh, they were constantly challenged over this contentious subject of resurrection. And I believe that we need to spend more time thinking about the resurrection because it is in understanding the resurrection that we have hope. If there is no resurrection, we have no hope. If we are the Epicurean and we appease our conscience by saying, after death there is nothing, um, that is hopelessness. And there is no incentive to be better or to be different or to acknowledge any higher power than that which we can exercise from our own thinking. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, great exponents of uh, resurrection uh, was the Apostle Paul. And I want to take just for an instant, for a moment, uh, we've talked a little about Jesus uh, demonstrating the resurrection, and he spoke considerably about it. And we might remember too that every time that Jesus spoke about his death, he also spoke about his resurrection. Check it out. Go through the Gospels and see every time Jesus spoke about his death, he also spoke about resurrection. Why? Because his disciples didn't understand it. That's why. And Jesus wanted them to be assured that he would rise from the dead and that his 
raising from the dead would ensure that those who followed him could also be raised from the dead. <clears throat> the Apostle John, and uh, our time is going so fast that I won't look these up, but I'll tell you the references. You might like to look them up sometime. First John chapter 2 and verse 17 <clears throat> And uh, we have there that the eternal life demands resurrection. There is no eternal life without resurrection. There's no such thing as sidestepping resurrection, that is, dying and going straight to heaven, or dying and going straight to hell. The resurrection is inevitable. There's no bypassing it. And so we arise in resurrection and eternal life demands that that should take place. Why should it take place? It takes place because it is evidence that Jesus Christ is the life giver. It's evidence to the universe out there that Jesus is the life giver. If it was any other way it could be misinterpreted and misconstrued by Satan or any of his agents and uh, the uh, um, the power of Jesus could be um, belittled in the minds of people. And so uh, 1 John 3 and verse 2, we're told that we will be like him. We don't know what we will be like after the resurrection exactly, but we do know, John says, that we will be like him. And the only way that we can be like him is if he grants us that privilege to be like him. So the resurrection, according to John, gives us the privilege of being like Jesus. He doesn't go into detail about what that's like. I don't think that my face will look just like Jesus' face. And I don't think that uh, I will have all the features in the physical form that Jesus has. But I do believe that I will have a body which is the new body, the immortal body, a body that is able to live forever, and I do believe that I'll have an inner being that is not prone towards yielding to Satan's temptations, no desire for evil, and uh, that uh, I will have, a, I will have a, an attitude of mind that Jesus has. And uh, so I'll be like him in so many ways. Most of all, I'll be like Jesus because I'll be able to live forever. John, John 5 and verse 12. And uh, John is saying that uh, it is Jesus who has life, and whoever has Jesus has life. And although our life might be gone in this world, for any one of a dozen reasons, if we have Jesus, we have life. And that's why Jesus answered the Sadducees, and he says, uh, I talk about Moses and, uh, and Elijah, I talk about those... Uh, um, are patriarchs of old as if they are alive because they had me and they had me and I consider them alive. The resurrection will just bring it to actual reality. And then of course John in the book of Revelation, also a book of victories over uh, adversity. Uh, Blessed are those who are in the first resurrection, he says. Blessed are those who are in the first resurrection. Chapter 21 verse 7 and those who overcome will inherit <coughs> all that God gives. In order to inherit what God gives, there must be a resurrection. Well, we could talk a lot about the Apostle Paul. You know, we use the Apostle Paul's writings when we, uh, when we come to funerals. Funny that, that we uh, probably only use those passages when we come to funerals. And I suppose uh, we should use them a lot more. And so I refer them to you uh, today. And uh, I'm going to, to read our funeral texts. We're in 1 Corinthians and uh, we're in chapter uh, 15 and reading from uh, verse 35. I think I've read this at so many funerals and I don't know how many people really take notice of it or not. But the Apostle Paul was very intent that people should understand that death is not the end and resurrection is real. I'm just going to pick some verses out of here as I go along. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? 
You fool, Paul says, or you ignorant person. That which you sow is not brought to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you sow not that body that was going to be, but bare grain. It may perchance be wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed it has his own body. And so he, Paul says, all flesh is not the same flesh.